Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Floretta. I work for the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. Uh, and on, on behalf of JPAL and on behalf of the economics department at MIT, I'm very happy to welcome you to the second Data Decisions Public Policy Lecture uh, here on campus. So Rukmini is one of uh, the leading experts on education in India, and I would say also globally. Uh, she spearheaded the annual status of education report, a massive citizen-led survey that for 10 years uh, surveyed over 600,000 kids in rural areas every year using 30,000 volunteers. Pratham also intervenes um, through a supplementary education program, which Rukmini will speak about, that j has collaborated with them on to test the effectiveness of. Just between 2010 and 2015, that program scaled to over 15 million children. Uh, Rukmini is a member of the Government of India Central Advisory Board of Education. She has a PhD from the University of Chicago, and she's a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, J-PAL and Pratham have, as I mentioned, collaborated over the last 15 years, and in each of these areas, that's their focus areas for J-PAL. So over the last 15 years, there's been 10 randomized evaluations in several states across India, looking at primary education programs, uh, pre-primary education programs. Based on what we found, Pratham has done a lot of policy work with state governments in India. J-PAL has collaborated with Pratham to share evidence and to help catalyze scale up in four states. And we've also worked with Indian governments, uh, including the Indian Economic Services, to build their capacity uh, to do monitoring and evaluation better. Without further ado, Dr. Banerjee, Rukmini, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, John. It's really good to be here for many reasons. Number one, nobody ever calls me Dr. Banerjee. I have a hard-earned PhD, I almost didn't finish it many times, and so it's really nice to be called a doctor, even if it's you know, once in five years. <laughs> the second reason is that, for some reason, which uh, probably needs another PhD, we are never invited in India to speak at any university. We work with primary education, Pratham means primary, and so we stick with schools, and so if I'm a little bit uh, you know, school teacher-like, it's because if we have students in front of us, they tend to be uh, under the age of 12. <laughs> uh, and Indian universities are at a far more high lofty level, so you know, we never speak to them. So it's really incredible to come here and to be actually speaking to adults at a you know, premier university. Um, I know that you have uh, time till five, right? So we want to leave enough time for questions. Um, and so I'll you know, do my bit, and then I hope we have good questions from here and from Papua New Guinea. <laughs> okay. um, so I'll start with a story. The story happened a few years ago. I had a phone call one day from uh, somebody, uh, and now at my age, you can kind of tell if the somebody is young or not. And this was a young man who, uh, I mean, I didn't know he was young, but he sounded young, from one of the districts in Bihar. And uh, he had uh, been told that perhaps we could help him with the problem he had. And so he was calling to kind of discuss his problem. And his problem, according to him, was that he was responsible for this district uh, called Jahanabad, which is a small district. It has about eight or 900 schools. And uh, at the time, the government in Bihar was very concerned about attendance. Uh, we have varying patterns of attendance. And, uh, the government really wanted attendance levels to go up in school, and Jahanabad was actually one of the districts which had the highest attendance in the, in the state, but still the attendance was in kind of high 60s or 70%. And he felt that he had done whatever was in his kind of you know, knowledge to do, and yet he was not able to change this attendance level to higher. And he wondered if we had any suggestions about what he could do. And as we were speaking, I, you know, I thought that this is not unusual. I mean, this is problems that I think uh, you know, we are seeing across India. And if, I, you know, if you look at it, you'll see that you know, lots has happened in education, especially in primary schooling in India. Last 10 years, last 20 years, whatever period you want to take, we have new laws, we have new, we have new um, 
schemes, expenditure is, has gone up, you know, uh, if, you, if you think about it, we had uh, in eighth grade, this, I find this number very interesting because not only are more and more children in school, we have uh, very high enrollment levels, but they are staying longer in school, which may be partly because we have a law which says that you, know, you have to be in school to the age 14 and you can't really hold anybody back so kids can go through grades one to eight almost automatically. But still in a 10 year period, and I don't know much about other countries, to have had an expansion from 12 million, 12 million is uh, about the population of, I know 24 million is about Texas. 12 million is? Two Massachusetts. Two Massachusetts, okay. So we have more age graders and you have people in Texas. Uh, and uh, I think that to have accomplished that in a period of you know, 10 years is a lot. Uh, but now that you know, we are at this stage where we've met the, whatever the previous goals were, they were called what MDG goals of everybody in school, the real challenge is that you know, what happens after this. And I think that uh, <coughs> around the time that uh, our uh, annual status of education report started, uh, and a lot of things in education were going on, uh, it, it was perhaps time to look at uh, how the data that we had or the data that was accumulating really fitted with the assumptions and the perceptions that both common people have as well as the government has or policymakers have. And you know, I will uh, kind of come to where JPAL and us started working, but I think it's worth looking at some of the key assumptions that underlie, uh, this is certainly for our school system, but presumably they apply for school systems in many places where the situation has changed quite rapidly. So your systems are all built on certain key assumptions. Simple things like who comes to school, when do they come, how long do they stay, who teaches whom, you know, how much is supposed to happen every year. These are all key elements of how you construct a school system. And you would like to think that these assumptions and the realities are pretty close together, which is how you think that policy is made based on uh, you know, what you see in front of you. Uh, in 2005, uh, we, Pratham, started doing uh, uh, what is now called the ASAR report, uh, the status, the annual status of education report. Uh, if I had more time, I would tell you the history of how the work we did with JPAL actually fed into this. Uh, there was uh, very briefly, a couple of years before 2005, we were actually doing uh, an experiment with uh, uh, sharing information at the village level. Uh, making village report cards along with people at the village level and seeing how that would translate into anything that went forward. Now, what happened to that is another story, but, but I think the, one of the things we learned is that very few, everybody in the village knew whether children were going to school or not, but very few people knew about whether children were learning and that this was almost a important activity to do to kind of just bring parents, community members, teachers, local officials, to a level where they could actually start focusing on uh, issues of what were happening in school. Uh, in case there's anybody here who doesn't know what the ASAR report involves, here are some details. It's a big survey done in the household, focuses on whether you go to school, whether you can read, whether you can do basic math. And it is generally done, not generally, it is always done at the district level by a local level, a, a local organization. But all the data is uh, aggregated and you have state level as well as national level, as well as district level um, uh, information. So we had this, uh, we have ASSER data. Much of what I'll say about the data informing what we should think comes from ASSER. But I think over the last 10 years, there's also been an uh, expansion of available current empirical data on schooling and other things associated with the education in India, all of which together I think points to certain things. So let me quickly take you through some you know, key assumptions. When do enter, children enter school? Now our law, the right to education law, starts at six. And like good Indian citizens, we never question the law. We also don't follow it, but we didn't question it. You know, six seems like the right age. You know, they're small children, they should go to school then. And so six to 14 seems you know, reasonable if you don't start looking at data. When you look at data, you find there's lots of people in school well before this. And so if you look at what, you know, this is from our ASAR data, which is rural, you see that quite a substantial number of children by five are already in school. 
And the way the survey questionnaire is constructed, we actually don't ask four-year-olds if they're in school or not, which we probably should do. And we may find that, you know, who knows? Basically, younger than five, there are substantial numbers of children in school. And they're in all kinds of schools. The, the preschool that we talk about here is actually a separate preschool. And then there are, for example, private schools in India don't take children in in first grade. You have to come in into this grade called LKG, which is a lower kindergarten. And you know, sometimes I find that by the time kids get to first grade, in elite private schools, they've already spent five years of school in various, I'm exaggerating, but many years already in various forms of kindergarten and lower and upper and middle kindergarten before you can get to first grade. Um, government schools generally start at first grade. There are a few states in which they may have a preschool class, but it's not very common. So it's possible that uh, already at age five, 50% kids are at first grade. Now, in a country where there's been a big focus in the last 10, 15 years on enrollment, this is not unnatural to have lots of children coming to school earlier and staying longer. But we'll see, uh, I think, as we go along, what the implications of this early enrollment uh, into school uh, may be. Assumption is that India has reached almost universal enrollment. Absolutely correct. I had a very good uh, definition of enrollment from a kid. I was in a primary school uh, in, uh, I think must have been in UP, and I don't know why this question came up, but I asked the kids, you know, what does the word, the word in Hindi for enrollment is namankan. It's a big fat word, you know, it means very serious sounding word. So what does enrollment mean? And one kid put up his hand and gave me a very good definition. He said, it means my name is in school. <laughs> and that's exactly what enrollment means. It means that we have brought all the names to school. And in, you know, depending on the state, as you can see, sometimes I'm in school and sometimes I'm not. But I think it's time we stopped, and I don't know if this is the case in other countries. I think enrollment is a thing of the past now. In many, many countries, I think we are reaching very high enrollment levels. And instead of kind of basking in the glow of enrollment, which is basically think of all these names, these are, this is enrollment, think about who's actually, you know, actually there. And when you start looking at that, you see there are large parts of India in which everybody is not in school every day. And I think we need to change the word for that to say that if you're not in school most of the time, then you're not in school. It doesn't help if you're in school you know, every Thursday because you know, that's only part of the time you ought to be in school. Uh, so this assumption about enrollment needs, it is true, but it needs to be perhaps you know, tweaked a bit and looked at uh, attendance. Uh, <clears throat> now, most school systems, other than maybe, I don't know, Finland or somewhere really nice, uh, the system is organized by age and grade. You're supposed to be in a certain grade at a certain age. And as you'll see, I mean, again, as you know, that kids in the same grade are taught kind of the same thing because that's how your school system is organized and that's how, you know, you're going to kind of go through it. Now, one of the first things to look at is who is how old in which grade. And here are two states in India and you can see that the age distribution by grade is very different. Bihar has a very broad range of kids, about a two thirds of whom are perhaps in what is thought of as the correct age range for the grade. You can always debate what that means uh, because they've had enrollment drives for a long time. It was educationally more backward. Children are not often born in hospitals. So the age, the age uh, uh, reporting is also you know, a little bit uh, not precise. It's not uncommon to go to somebody's house and say, how old is Rachel? And they'll say, oh, she must be four, five, or six. Which is mostly, it's fine if it's 45, 46, or 47. But at four, five, or six, it makes a big difference about whether you're going to be treated in school as a four-year-old, or a five-year-old, or a six-year-old. And so there's some of that as well, that age is imprecisely reported. Uh, you may have more children in that age range, and so on. But it still shows that as you approach a school system, big differences in age could make, uh, you know, it could make life difficult for people who have to deal with you in school. Um, I'm going to stop giving you assumptions, but here is one that's getting closer to where we are at. So in India, much of what happens in classrooms, instruction, is largely based on textbooks or curricula that have been made for that grade. 
right? And you know, any studies of teaching in India will show you that bulk of teaching is done from the textbook. And even our right to education law actually says that one of the things the law wants to achieve is completion of the syllabus of that year within that year. Now, what that means is that there is a big, uh, big focus on teaching the grade level curriculum. So this is what the Asser tool looks like. It's, we have it in many languages, whatever the language of instruction. And you can see that even in fifth grade, if I take the highest level here, which is the story, is a second grade level. We can see that across the country, varying numbers of fifth graders are able to even reach the second grade level. We'll talk about the grade level later, but this is, that means that nationally, about half the children are able, are at second grade level, perhaps because we don't measure higher, they may be higher than that. But it certainly means that at least half the children nationally in grade five are not at grade two level. But what are they being taught? In grade five, they are taught the grade five stuff, whatever that may be. So here is an assumption that really, you know, is far away from the reality of what you see. Now, what about how many kids in India? I'm often asked this in government meetings, you know, that Asar keeps talking about what kids at fifth grade, you know, whether kids at fifth grade are at least at second grade level. So how many, uh, what proportion of kids in India are at grade level? Here is one way to answer it. If I look at the grade three uh, results from the Asar data and look at who is able to do grade two stuff, you're kind of close to, you know, grade level. And the, the uh, darker, uh, the orange, uh, is the uh, aggregate uh, percentage of children in grade three from government schools, and the yellow is from private schools. And you can see that even in private schools, which are commonly supposed to be much better than government schools, uh, this is of course not controlling for anything, even in private schools, only half the children are in, second in third grade at grade level. Now on this picture, if I put a state like UP, which is one of our biggest and most backward states, you find that in government schools in UP, 10% or lower are at grade level. And that means that much of what happens in the school, this is what Esther and Abhijit refer to in their book as teaching to the top of the class. But the top of the class can be really slim, <laughs> depending on the state. And therefore, you know, as you look at what happens to the pathways of children through school, I think a lot of what the patterns that you see in early grades in school about who's at the grade level are the only, it's only that sort of tip of the iceberg that has even a fighting chance of moving to the top. So, you know, uh, this is another, I think, that the data, that accumulating data clearly shows you how far away the policy of teaching grade level stuff is, how far away it is from the uh, reality. Another uh, you know, few quick assumptions that you, know, you assume that as you spend more, as you know more about uh, how to deliver education, you must be getting better every year. Uh, not only the Asset data, but every data set from India over the last you know, some years is showing declining levels. So if you were in fifth grade in 2010 and your brother is in fifth grade in 2014, <coughs> you can be sure that you got more or you were at a higher level of learning. Even though that learning level was low, it was relatively higher for you than for your brother. And this uh, you know, decline from 2010 onwards is something that now even the government data is showing. So this seems to point to the fact that we are not getting better <laughs> every year. In fact, up to, up to from 2005 to 2010, if we looked at the data, you were kind of in a big stuck. But 2010 onwards, it almost seems like, or nine onwards, you, it almost seems like you're, at least in the government schools, it's going uh, down. So these are some kind of assumptions that, uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, I think and you could have more. The more uh, data that is available, the more that you take out of it, I think there is uh, many pointers to the fact that there really needs to be a rethinking about how you construct your whole system and also, of course, of what you want to get out of it. So if you want to get learning, basic levels of learning to rise, I think many of these assumptions you know, need to be re-looked and uh, rethought. But coming back to the original story in Jahanabad, uh, you know, when, um, when um, uh, this uh, young man asked us what to do, 
uh, we said, okay, I mean, there's many things to be done. We have many grades and many things that need to be changed. But how about if you just look at these three grades, grade three, four, and five, and uh, you know, look at you know what um, uh, where the kids are at, and uh, you know, I mean, looking at the ASSER data, we could almost predict where they were at, but see if they are able to do some basic things. And uh, you know, we were going to go by and visit them in a few days' time. And by the time we did that, the district had done its own evaluation. They had used their own tools. But fundamentally, what they had done is they had taken second grade level tools and tested kids in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And what they found was quite similar to what Asar finds. But the tool was their own. They had done it in their own way. They had selected their own schools. And what they found is about 30% of kids could even read uh, you know, words or sentences. So there was at least something new that the district came up with. And even though they were interested in attendance, I think the idea that there was something fundamentally to be done inside the classrooms was becoming apparent to them. And having accepted the problem and found the current status themselves, I think that our work was much easier because when we showed up, they were very ready to talk about what to do about this. You know, much of uh, the last couple of years in India has been spent in trying to convince people that this is the problem. But I think the existing, uh, the existence of more and more information is helping to now accept the problem. And I think and I hope that we are at a stage where we now want to solve the problem. Now, the problem has many levels, but at least the challenge in front of us in this particular case was the remainder of the school year. I think this was around July or August. Our school year runs till the end of uh, March. What can we do in the remaining months, which are full of holidays also, because you know we are a very uh, happy nation. We like to celebrate festivals whenever we can. Uh, and when we don't have festivals, we have elections and other such things, which <laughs> involve schools being shut. Uh, but so let us say that between August and March, you have at least four or five instructional months available. What can be done in a system uh, to change this? And so, uh, you know, based on a whole set of experiments and evaluations that have been done uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Pratham, many of which have been done with the help of JPAL, we've uh, basically come to, I think, a very common sense uh, kind of a position, which is that if you know where the kids are at, then you start where the kids are and work with them towards a very clear, uh, clearly articulated goal and if you change your teaching methodology to really fit the level of the kids and use methods and materials accordingly, then you make a lot of progress. We've seen this happen when we as Pratham do it ourselves with kids, when volunteers do it with kids, and therefore why should it be any different when teachers do it with kids? And so what was done in Jahanabad, we've just you know, listed this out. We focused on grades three, four, five, and hopefully somebody will ask me a question, so I won't tell you the answer now, about why this, these particular grades put aside some time during the school day. In the past, we've worked quite effectively during school time, which we feel is a time that can be maximized. And then group the children, assess them with the, using the tool that you saw, group them by that level, allocate the teachers according to uh, how many teachers you have. So if you have three teachers, you have three groups. If you have two teachers, you'll have two groups. If you have more than that, you have more groups. And focus really on the first step, which is building basic reading skills basic skills of being able to communicate or understand what you've read, and some fundamentals in arithmetic like numbers and uh, operations. And to do this, we had also learned uh, during the course of our uh, work with uh, schools that you need in schools a certain leadership cadre who can actually help the teachers do this. In India, these guys are called you know, cluster coordinators in some states who are uh, a level up from the teachers. Uh, every cluster coordinator has 12 or 15 schools. And so what we first did was to have these people do this kind of teaching themselves, experience for themselves, that big learning gains can be had even in a short period of time, and then have them work with teachers to follow this through. So the Pratham role was really to guide and support a core group who and convince them and I mean, convinced, they have to be convinced by their own work that even in a short period of time, big gains can be made on very basic skills. And then once they are convinced, to help them to translate this uh, to helping teachers. 
Um, I want to save time for us to, uh, to discuss. So this is the kind of change we saw uh, in Jahanabad. And this is, you know, we see similar changes elsewhere. Uh, that in the beginning, in the baseline, sometime in August, you can see that the percentage of kids who could read was quite small. And then by the end line in March, and literally this was about, once you counted the number of days and at the hours, this was something like 120 or between 100 and 120 hours of instruction. If you take an hour or an hour and a half every day. And you could see that done by the school teachers, supported by their own officials, you could have quite a big change happen even in one school year. Something that had not happened in three or five years of schooling, simply by reorganizing. And in a way, if you think of the school system as rows and columns, where the rows are grades and the columns are different levels, all we had essentially done was to move a school system which was organized by rows into a school system that was organized by columns. The columns are kids at the same level regardless of grade and uh, you know, have time within the school day for them to be taught by level rather than by grade. Why did we do this? This is a quick sort of history of you know, the kinds of evaluations that have happened over a period of time. I think you know, the details are here. But it is more or less, I would say, a 10, 15 year history of having worked, uh, worked on the ground by, you know, in many contexts by ourselves. But also, you know, these are about, uh, depending on how you count, five or six uh, randomized evaluations on different parts of, on the, you know, as the model was developing, we also had uh, this kind of uh, evaluation going on alongside, which helped both to refine the elements of the model that we thought would work, and to create some very rigorous evidence for backing what we may have suggested. So there was no randomized evaluation done in Jahanabad itself, but exactly at the same time, there was an evaluation of pretty much the same model happening in another state in Haryana, following more or less the same path that it convinced us that these are the kinds of strategies that work uh, and uh, you know, uh, are very effective with using very um, uh, limited resources other than what exists in the system. This is a, a, a graph by John, and I had to have it here because uh, yeah, I knew he'd be here. Uh, but basically, this you know, shows you uh, what were the kinds of effect sizes that we had over time. The tallest one is something where we, as Pratham, led the instruction, which perhaps, you know, given what we know today, gives us kind of that that is possible. Uh, but it was also carried out in a state with extremely low baselines. And the rest are all the, varied, the, very, uh, the various uh, interventions that we have tried so far. So I want to just stop by saying that um, there are you know, many things that need to be done in India or in countries like that. And uh, you know, one thing we can see from the work that has been done and the work that is going on is that business as usual can't solve the problem. Just by adding more inputs over the last 10 years, the expenditure on inputs in education in India has really gone up. But we don't see any impact of that on learning levels. In fact, if anything, we see things are going down. So of the current kind of views on what should be done, you know, I'm, I'm of course you know, uh, summarizing very quickly, there are still people who are quite preoccupied with inputs who feel that unless you still have more teachers, better buildings, better textbooks, things can't change. And you know, the rights-based approach often pushes on this to say that this is, you know, without adequate inputs, you can't really expect any outcomes. And I see as you know, people are moving towards technology, a similar thing, that you need to have tablets, you need to have technology. You know, I think that technology fits nicely into this input orientation that I need to give more than I will be able to get you know, more out. So that's certainly one pathway that uh, people think about. Then there is a whole set of, I think, uh, I've clubbed them all together and those who belong in these buckets won't like being clubbed, but you know, we are at 439 and I want to stop talking at 440, so I've clubbed them together, uh, saying that there is a kind of a techno-managerial view of education systems, just make everybody work and you know, fight hard, uh, make sure that everybody shows up at work, nobody's absent and everything will improve. And to some extent, our Jahanabad guy had reached that point. He'd done all of these. And then still seen that despite doing all of that, he hadn't got the kinds of you know, changes that he wanted. 
there are others who believe that you know you if whatever gets what uh, whatever gets measured gets done so you know you focus a lot on the measurement and then you hope that the done will happen uh, then there is of course you know there is always room for different kinds of incentives improving accountability structures governance in a country like india all of these are needed so you know you could do all of these and you could wait to see what happens uh, another school of thought believes that our teachers are not strong enough that unless i get a cadre of teachers who are really you know equipped to deal with this situation how can we change and there are those who believe that we need to have teacher proof ways of delivering education so whether that's through technology or scripted lessons or whatever it may be that you know it is the 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 delivery of the teaching that is that is a problem um, you can always have more motivated people you know leadership reflection all of these are of course there but what we are really focusing on is the fact that you know if you think about what can be done very quickly teaching at the right level if that's the name we give this whole process uh, with very clear goals putting in uh, putting in place the fact that if you don't have certain foundational basic skills in place you really can't make progress beyond that and that these the older the kids are the faster you can have these in place so we find that this teaching at the right level is certainly something that can be done immediately i am not saying that you don't need better institutional capacity or better accountability all of those are also needed but the evidence on uh, not just you know one or two studies but a whole decade of evidence that has accumulated on the effectiveness of this is something that i think we at least would like uh, to push in india and uh, you know convince more people that this is low hanging fruit and once you actually are able to energize the system then many more things can happen so if i think about what happened in jahanabad or in places similar to that like in haryana or others you had a system which was kind of stuck everybody blamed each other the teachers blamed the parents because the parents are not providing any learning support at home the parents blamed the teachers because there was nothing really happening to the kids that they could see that an additional year in school was creating and frankly the kids were very amused by this because they couldn't figure out what was going on in school and they would just go home after a midday meal and play because you know at least that's more pleasurable given this kind of a kind of a disenchanted uh, you know system that is if you think about it the teacher is working hard but she's teaching for the grade level curriculum which is what she's been taught how to do and when she works hard and she sees no change in children then you typically i mean most human beings don't blame themselves you blame you know other people around you uh, parents also are not to be blamed because they are sending kids to school on a fairly regular basis and seeing no change and kids you know i mean nobody has left this room but if i was really boring some people would have left and you know that's fair enough as well that if you are not getting value for your time why would you waste time so for a situation like this it's really important i think to see some visible change happen quickly because that then builds the confidence among all parties concerned that this is something that's worth investing in and i think that apart from uh, the fact that there is uh, you know very strong evidence for this i think we as a country need to be energized and believe that we can bring ourselves bring about change without a lot of additional resources i have a sign which said please stop so i've stopped okay <laughs> Great. Thank you very, very much, uh, Rukmini. So you can, you can stay up here because you still have to answer questions. <laughs> But uh, so let me start with, with the first question. Um, I'll take the prerogative of being the moderator. So in thinking about how data from Osser, which showed that learning levels are a problem, to now data that's been generated about what the potential solution could be, this teaching at the right level, Can you explain a little bit about your interactions with policymakers and maybe specifically government in India with this data to you know how useful has it been and what have been some of the challenges both to help them understand you know the nature of the problem and also the potential solution So if I start from the actual you know people who deal with the kids uh, if I take for example uh, teachers or these cluster coordinators I think one of the big things is you have to be convinced yourself that there is a problem because in your perception 
There is this school system where people are moving by age and grade and the way to get them through is by teaching the grade level curriculum. That's how you've grown up and that's how a lot of middle class people have learned because that's kind of how the middle class system works. So I think the first challenge was how do you get people to be convinced firsthand? You know, reports and so on are fine, but that's like, you know, India is a big country, lots of people, lots of problems, but you know, do I have a problem? And one of the things, you know, there has to be an aha moment where you accept the problem for yourself. We would see that, for example, uh, I think we saw that in Jaunpur as well when people would do the village report cards, but then they were not capable of taking the action after that. So as an illiterate parent, you realized that there was a problem, but you had no resources to do anything about it. With the teachers or the cluster coordinators, we often do, we say, what is the attendance like in a school like yours? Put it down. So they'll put down enrollment is this and attendance is this. And then we'll say, what do you think? Do you think kids in fifth grade or fourth grade can read this? Put down a number. And we put down a number. Mm -hmm. And then literally, the whole crew goes out to neighboring schools to find out what the situation is. And you come back and you put down that number next to it. The attendance numbers are very close because you're well, you know, uh, accustomed to what the attendance patterns are. And typically, the learning numbers are very far from each other. What you thought was the situation in your schools versus what it is, as you have seen on your own in a school like yours. So there is some way in which we feel that, at least in India, the data has to become real for you. And one way to do it is to have very simple assessment. And then when the data becomes real for you, you must have some strategies about how to solve it. Otherwise, you get into this endless you know, blaming of the whole world. So I think what, at a very fundamental level, I think it's been a lot easier to convince people closer to the kids because they get convinced by their own data. And then when they see there are studies done which actually support this kind of a pathway, mm. then you're re reassured that it's not just me and my kids and these people who are telling me what to do. But there are people from MIT who have said this is okay, so then it must be okay. I mean, I think it helps to have, you know, solid research that backs now your first-hand experience. Mm. The difficulty is when people are very high up and have a notion that all the kids, kids in India go to schools like their kids, where grade level teaching makes complete sense and where all the teachers show up all the time. To break that mindset, I think, you know, there I think having these rigorous studies which have been done where there is some understanding perhaps of what goes into a rigorous research mm. makes a difference. So we feel you have to work with data and assessment and measurement both at a micro level as well as at a high level. And you probably need a whole range of evidence. I mean, mm. all of which in this case is pointing in the same direction mm. to help people change their. But there is a big, I think, work to be done between assumptions and reality. Mm. And I can't see anything other than experience and evidence, you know, bridging that. I'd like to open up questions to the audience. We'll take a couple of questions, and then we'll see if questions have come in as well through the web. But um, yeah, please, Mira. Um, hello, I'm Mira Subramani. I'm a night science journalism fellow here. Um, can you answer the question around how difficult it is to scale up things that are um, so easy, easy in quotes, to implement in terms of the structure already being there? But about the scalability um, and challenges. Okay, you know, I'll take a couple and then okay. you answer them in batches. Anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, one of the specific examples of the uh, I think I've seen the uh, for instance, the fact that the problem was articulated by someone within the, the uh, context um, and that the villages or the district's own data supported your uh, assessment. Outside of that, when you're trying to scale it up, I guess it's related to the question you asked earlier, um, you run into the same challenges of you know, teachers being willing to accept that the problem stems from the way they teach, uh, which is something that policymakers have uh, said that they should teach. So it, it then can escalate into a big game, and until someone else accepts that this is the problem, um, scaling up is a challenge. Great. Should should we should we? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just repeat them just for the yeah. for the benefit of the web audience. So so one question about going from like hard evidence to scale, and then the second, you know, in in Jahanabad we had you know a district collector I believe who was very uh, interested in in and in, in willing to accept the problem. In other situations when folks aren't 
willing to accept the problem or what may be the causes of the problem, uh, what can we do about that? So I think we can think about scalability in a couple of different ways. One is uh, what we had tried to do uh, in uh, one of the RCTs, uh, which was a totally a community-based one. So when you look as a village community or an urban community, whatever it may be, when you actually prepare these little report cards yourself, you know, what can be done uh, to change the situation? Let us say that the school system needs a different kind of change. Can you persuade, do people get persuaded who are just ordinary people to do something with their kids? And the answer to that is surprisingly yes, but it needs a demonstration. So even in the studies that were done, just the information in its own was not enough. What really worked was if somebody said, here is the way that I can help, here is a way that you can teach, try it out yourself and see if it works. So some amount of demonstration and handholding seemed to suggest that a lot of people, if given a fairly straightforward method, would actually take it on. Now, would they do it forever? Would they do it for a few months? Would they, you know, we've tried many different ways. And we find that people, ordinary people, can give short bursts of time if they are supported a little bit. Last winter, we did a big campaign called Lakho Me Ek. You know, I mean, literally translated it would mean uh, 100,000, one in 100,000, but one in a million. You know, is your village one in a million? And are you one in a million? And would you like to change your village? We were really taken aback at how many people came forward to say, I want to help. And we were short in how do you, con I mean, how from a distance can you help hundreds of thousands of people help their own community? What would be that? method. Our method here is quite okay for training teachers, for training people who are going to give some time. But if you're far away from me and you want to help, what do I tell you that, you know, how do I give you that demonstration or that hand holding? So I think that the possibility for scaling <laughs> using uh, kind of remote methods still needs to be worked out. But where volunteers are actually close to you, it seems like in, if you've worked out, the way we work with volunteers now is do it in bursts of eight or 10 days uh, over a period of three months where you do this three or four times, you do get a lot of volunteer uh, support. But there is this portion of hand-holding and supporting that seems to be still necessary before it can scale through just ordinary people. Uh, on the teacher side, uh, you're absolutely right because there is, I mean, teachers in India are not autonomous. They have to, I mean, our law says finish the syllabus on time, whatever the syllabus may be. But we find that when we work with state governments, you actually try to create some space where what you're supposed to do can be put aside and what makes sense can be done. So we have, we, in fact, when we work a lot with government school teachers, they relate quite well to this if the curriculum can be held at bay by someone else. Uh, because this is, you know, you can see immediately that, you know, kids begin to respond well. And I think that, uh, you know, there have been um, uh, another study that we did you, teachers taught in the summer program, it was like a summer camp where curriculum was put aside because summer is not a time when you have to teach you know, your structured way. Uh, and the same teachers were able to make much more progress when they were able to work at this teaching at the right level without the, you know, uh, the uh, curriculum hanging over them as compared to the school year when they were compelled to use it. State governments who want this change are able to push the curriculum aside for a couple of hours a day. Uh, but eventually the thing comes around to saying, what about the curriculum? Now, what about the curriculum? I mean, actually the curriculum has to be rethought completely and you have to think about how to sequence it. But until then I feel like it's like you give me an inch, I'm gonna park a car and then the car is gonna be so big that the car is gonna take up all the space. That's the strategy that is being used. But today, I mean, there are, I'm sure others who are doing this, but out of India's, what, 650 districts or so, about 160 are doing some version of this with us. And there may be more who are doing it uh, elsewhere. So how to change this stranglehold of the curriculum is a big challenge. It's also a political challenge. So a couple of days ago in Delhi, the education minister has declared that we need to fix this first. If we don't do this, kids can't move. So politically, that's a very uh, courageous statement to make because everybody is still in this mindset that, you know, really the way to teach is uh, age and grade. Great, thanks. She, she had a, I think she had a question, no? Yeah. I was wondering how, um, how time intensive 
resource intensive it is to train teachers to teach with this level based approach. Okay. How time and resource intensive it is for training teachers? Yeah, in the back. Why focus on three, four, and five? And are there other things, other issues that Pratham has tried to tackle, like nutrition or other potential impediments to learning? And just one more, right? Also, one more. I mean, I'm stemming from this question. Uh, why is this Aksar Obhami again? Why is focusing on the household data as opposed to school wide data? But if the household data accommodate uh, for what uh, environment is being provided at the household? Like, is the environment conducive enough? And how is Asal capturing that? Say, say the proportion of income kept aside for education or parents' education themselves. How is Asal accounting for something like that, if it is doing so? And if there is scope for accounting for something like that, it's not there. So why the focus on, on school level? Uh, does Asal capture why is Asar household, household, household level yeah. as opposed to school level? Does Asal does house capture other household characteristics? So let me go in reverse order. Asar is at the household level for very, uh, I think, practical reasons. Uh, one is that we care about every child, right? Not just about children who are in certain kinds of schools. So if you want to get at a representative sample of all children, the only place to find them is at home. Because kids go to government schools, kids go to private schools. We don't have a complete census of schools in India. There are lots of private schools which are kind of fly-by-night schools. So there's not a universal list of schools that I can sample from. We have you know, religious kinds of schools. We have all kinds of schools. The second thing is we also have very big variations in attendance. So you may be enrolled in school, but a school-based survey will really measure those who are in school today. So if I really want to get at a representative sample of all children, the most convenient place to go to is the household, because you can do you know, sampling at the household level. The second reason was that you actually want a lot of discussion on this whole issue. You know, we've succeeded on schooling, and we are at a very early stage of now getting to universal learning. Uh, and therefore, for many people, including for economists until very recently, schooling, years of schooling was used as a proxy for whatever it is that education is supposed to do to you. And we are seeing now more and more that that's not the case. You could be five years, eight years in school, but your learning level may be at second grade level. So these two are, you know, if you put them on two axes, it's not like it's, there's a, uh, you know, a, a steady curve going upwards. Uh, and so you want a lot of discussion on this. The discussions within the school will be of one type, but how do you have parents and other people also start thinking about this? So another reason for going to the household was you wanted widespread participation in the discussion about what is learning, how can it be done, and so on and so forth. We do collect a few household level characteristics, but we feel, as you can see from the data here, that even in the most backward state of the country, among the poorest kids, massive increases are possible. Our country has resources. We are spending quite a lot in school on children. And even at home, even quite poor families are willing to spend. The problem is that this spending is not translating into effective value. And really, the, the school-based work that we do is a way to not add any additional resources, really, but to reorganize the resources so that gives you the, you know, the, uh, the value on which you can then continue to build. In terms of, uh, um, uh, so therefore, you know, we, yes, kids may be coming hungry, but there is a law which says a hot meal every day in school. In many places, it does happen. So we don't, I mean, as Pratham, we, our forte is to work on this basic reading level of kids, reading on math level, and that's what we do. And we see regardless of background, regardless of number of teachers, it's really the effort of translating that method into uh, you know, what goes on with the kids that reaps the results. Grades three, four, and five, because they're already at a stage where they can actually grasp more. In first grade, you often have very young kids. And they need, I mean, there's no hurry there as well. 
you need to spend your time in building the foundations and in first and second grades, I don't think you need an accelerated way to get to that. By third, fourth and fifth grade A, you are probably, you know, you've been exposed to school, so you know, you're already used to school. You're used to schooling, you're not used to learning, but you're used to schooling. You are also able to make progress quite fast. For third, fourth and fifth grade, we see 100 hours is quite substantial for making this change. In sixth and seventh grades, it's even less because you're that much older, you're that much more exposed to things, and your foundations, you're, it is that much more urgent that you're able to have these basic skills in place so you can move on. So third, and the government currently is focusing a lot on first and second grade, and like you know, the rest of the world on STEM in upper primary or middle school. Forgetting that there is, you know, we have 25 million kids in each age group. So this third, fourth, and fifth grade alone is 75 to 80 million kids on whom nobody is focusing. And if you don't fix these things now, they are never ever going to be able to go. So there are strategic reasons for why we focus. And then we see that there are good learning gains, which are quite durable uh, you know, once you focus on these. Uh, um, teacher, how much cost? Somebody asked the first question. Just in general, how, what does that cost us? Yeah, so for us, if I am able to, so even in a big district in India, which may have more than 2,000 schools, the number of cluster people is only about 150 or 200. And so we invest heavily in those guys. Investment in them doesn't necessarily mean that I have to be with them all the time. So we usually do four days of training with them, half of which is spent in neighboring schools, and then they do 20 days of instruction themselves in their own schools. And that too, they don't do all day. They do exactly an hour, an hour and a half. So in that sense, it's just piggybacking onto the work they're supposed to do. So again, they are there, they are paid. Currently, they do a lot of data collection, you know, inspection. How do you convert that into actually academic leadership and support? And once they've done that, then you attach them to their own teachers with whom they are supposed to be doing this. So teachers in India are supposed to get 20 days of training into which these four days can fit, four or eight days can fit quite easily. So additionality, there is only the one additionality which is a little bit, because you're get, trying to get away from the grade level curriculum, you need some simple stories for the kids to read, large font, simple things, without saying read first grade stuff. Because you know, kids in fifth grade don't want to read first grade stuff. So it has to look like this is special, and it's for you, and it's, you know, so that, that requires a little bit of money. But other than that, it's just, Re, you know, reuse, reorganizing the use of internal, I mean, resources that are already there. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to the, the second D squared, P squared lecture. Uh, we look to have a couple of more of these uh, throughout the fall and spring semesters. Um, some of the JPAL folks, I believe, will stick around if you want to have ask questions about JPAL. Uh, I think we'll be outside next to the cookies. Uh, but I can't let everybody go without, I mean, we are from India. We have to show a film. Ah, OK. <laughs> so it's a very short one, not like a usual Bollywood movie. All right. But I, I, think, I think if you have two more minutes, see the film, and then you can go. All right. It's... Thank you so much. गवर्नमेंट स्कूल में सभी चीज दिया जाता है पोशाक दिया जाता है स्कॉलरशिप दिया जाता है एमबीएम दिया जाता है फ्री बुक्स दिया जा रहा है लर्निंग लेवल बहुत पुअर था टीचर जो टीच करते हैं वो एक ही ग्रुप को करते हैं जो अदर ग्रुप्स है वो डिफरेंट लेवल में वो लोग सीख नहीं पाते जो कमी है उसको एसेस करने के लिए हम लोगों को कैसा करेंगे क्या कैसा आगे बढ़ेंगे एजुकेशन सिस्टम में मालूम नहीं था उसके बाद प्रथम टीम आई हम लोग डिस्कस किया था ठीक हम लोग सिस्टमेटिक वे में पायलट के रूप में मोदनगंज काको ब्लॉक में इसको शुरू करेंगे ये लोगों का लर्निंग लेवल पहले असेस करेंगे क्लासिफाई करेंगे वो लोगों को पांच ग्रुप में एक प्रारंभिक महल है दूसरा अक्षर महल तीसरा शब्द महल अनुच्छेद महल अन्य कहानी स्टेज दो ब्लॉक में लगभग सोलह बच्चों को असेस किया है उसको कैसा करवाएंगे किससे करवाएंगे उस पर मंथन हुआ सिस्टम बिल्डिंग वॉज नॉट हैपनिंग 
इसके लिए इस बार हम लोग सोचा इसको हम लोग लीड नहीं करेंगे इसको सियासी के माध्यम से क्लस्टर रिसोर्स सेंटर कोऑर्डिनेटर के माध्यम से इसको लीड करवाएंगे सियासी के अंदर में 10 से 15 विद्यालय होते हैं और अपने विद्यालयों के बारे में उनको सब कुछ पता होता है चाहे वो बच्चों की शैक्षण की स्थिति हो या टीचर के क्वालिटी के बारे में हो इसमें पंद्रह सियासी से काको मोदनगंज में वो लोगों को तीन दिवसीय ट्रेनिंग दिया गया So CRCs were made to understand. They were made to do this practically by themselves. When they did that, they understood. Okay, this is doable. उसके बाद हम लोग लगभग 690 टीचर्स को आइडेंटिफाई करके वो लोगों को ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम शुरू किया। जी पहले नहीं लगता था कि हम लोग ऐसा कर सकेंगे। अपने ऊपर कॉन्फिडेंस नहीं था। लेकिन जैसे मैंने ये ट्रेनिंग लिया ना, तो मुझे लगा कि नहीं मैं ऐसा कुछ कर सकती हू� जो बच्चों और शिक्षकों के बीच में जो गैपिंग था वो गैपिंग समाप्त हो गया है सारे बच्चे शिक्षक के साथ ये अपनी बातों को रख रहे हैं उनसे शेयर कर रहे हैं छोटे छोटे ग्रुप में आपस में बातचीत कर रहे हैं कुछ कुछ चीज़ें जमीन पर लिखने वाली क्रियाएं कर रहे हैं मिड टर्म एवेलुएशन करके हम लोग देखा देखने से पता चला Tremendous improvement in reading ability. When we started this program, we had 12 children in Akshar, and we had 8 children in Akshar. We were going to go to the whole world. We also have to involve the community. For that, we have to effectively do a parent-teacher's meeting. One day, we saw that we are reading. We were so happy that we were going to say 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 that. ये जो छोटा सा गोल है इस कार्यक्रम का कि सारे बच्चे फ्लुएंट रीडर बन जाए सात दिनों के बाद लेकिन बड़ा पिक्चर इस कार्यक्रम का जो है कि स्कूल के फंक्शनिंग स्ट्रक्चर जो है उसमें परिवर्तन आए जैसे कि स्कूल में बच्चे बहुत कम आते हैं वो कैसे आएंगे बच्चे अगर आते हैं तो सीख नहीं रहे हैं वो कैसे सीखेंगे अगर बच्चे सीख रहे हैं तो उनके विवाहों को पता नहीं है ये सारी चीज़ों को चेंज करने के लिए इस कार्यक्रम प्रभु जहानाबाद कार्यक्रम में सब देखने को मिल रहा है प्राइमरी एजुकेशन में कमी है दूर करने के लिए इनिशिएटिव हुआ हम लोग शुरू किया था फायरली सक्सेसफुल इनिशिएटिव है